control Shoveling dirt in every hole Predators to condemn your soul Watching you and watching me We're all connected but separated Misunderstood and so frustrated A million armies of one have invaded Watching you and watching me To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric guy with the digital spies Little brother Standing by to dethrone each other Watching you and watching me Paranoid, the lens is our weapon Desensitized in our lust for attention Democratized by our voyeur obsessions Watching you and watching me Slips to perfection Don't let them project you as you are To make headlines be immortalized Everyone's got an electric guy with the digital spies Stay in line, don't make a mistake We're watching
Let your experience begin right now. From high atop the mountains of British Columbia to you listening around the world, this is Spaced Out Radio. You can follow us on our website, spacedoutradio.com, on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. You can follow us on Instagram, Dave Scott, S-O-R, or on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride as we are live on Spaced Out Radio. And welcome to Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Good to have you along for the ride as we broadcast out of Uncle Jimbo's cabin in the Great White North right here on SpacedOutRadio.com, on Spreaker, and on Revolution Radio. Live on this Wednesday night, early Thursday morning if you're on the East Coast. Here at Spaced Out Radio, we do this thing every night of the week as we want to be your one-stop shop when it comes to the cryptozoological, the supernatural, the ufological, and so much more. We want to thank our resident guitar god Ron Bumblefoot Thal, formerly of Guns N' Roses, for helping us with all of our theme music. Bumblefoot is the official sound of SOR. Hey, you can follow us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, we can be followed at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Find us on TuneIn. Download our shows from iTunes. And, of course, our website is spacedoutradio.com. At this time, we say hi to everyone taking part in the Revolution Radio chat room on the High Plains Talk Radio Network, in the Space Out Radio chat room on Spreaker, along with our fans at Facebook, at Euphoria Chronicles, Chronicles of the Unknown, Forest Moon Paranormal, and our flagship chat room, the SOR Space Travelers. If you haven't signed up for the SOR Space Travelers Club yet, you have just a couple days before we make our next draw, because with your subscription... For just 5 bucks a month, your name gets entered into monthly prize draws. You get access to private group interviews, access to a special section on our website, and so much more. At SpacedOutRadio.com, you can also read our latest blogs and check out Eric Markham's SOR Spacewire for your latest and weird news. We also have a new feature on the site. The SOR Sightlines Report is there for you. If you've had an experience and you want it investigated by our researcher, Mike Schmidt, just fill out a Sightlines Report. We'll get back to you as quickly as possible. All information is 100% confidential. Remember, if you're a listener on Revolution Radio, it is the largest nonprofit online radio station online. Do us a favor, take the time to visit freedomslips.com and donate today. Tonight we are stepping back into the forests of North America where we are looking for a creature that should be on all fours but seems to come around as a bipedal walker as well. The Dogman first recorded sightings of this anomalous creature came in the 1800s in the state of Michigan. The creature was described back then as a 7 foot tall, blue eyed and amber eyed bipedal canine like animal with a torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. If that's not enough to make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, then I'm not sure what would. It's funny because I've seen Bigfoot, and yet this one, the Dogman, is quite intimidating to think about. Linda Godfrey is someone whom I absolutely love and respect. I love to call her the Queen of Dogman Research. 
Her book, The Beast of Bray Road, is an incredible piece of research of the Dogman in Wisconsin. And now Linda has a new book on cryptids coming out, Monsters Among Us, which I am totally excited about. Her website is lindagodfrey.com. Linda, welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. It's been a while, but it's always a pleasure to have you on the air with us. Hey, Dave. It's great to be back. Thank you so much. Well, you know what? We have you for the next two hours, so I'm excited to get into this whole dogman talk because it seems like a lot more people are having the dogman experience. We're going to spend a lot of time on that tonight, but for the listeners who are new to this and new to you, how did you get involved with being the queen of dogman research? Well, first of all, I like that you say that I'm the queen of dogman research and not queen of dogman because, you know, that just, (laughs) that just doesn't sound right to me. So uh, thank you. Thank you for that. I don't know if it's true or not, but I have been at this a long time. I don't consider myself an expert, but just a very serious student who has been um, involved in the research uh, for decades, you know, so that, that's probably how I would put that. And it was never my intention. I did not, you know, grow up thinking someday I'm going to write books about creatures that look like werewolves. And, in fact, my degree is in art education. I have some uh, further work I did in library science. Um, Nothing to do with these things. Although, if I'd known when I started out, it would have been nice to have had a zoology class or something like that. But as it turned out, I was um, working sort of part-time freelance for a newspaper, and then they hired me on to be a reporter. I had been working creating editorial cartoons and, and other types of uh, comic strips and that sort of thing for the paper. And one of the first assignments that I got was to discover whether there was anything to the rumors around my own hometown of Elkhorn, Wisconsin, that people were seeing what they described as a werewolf out on Bray Road which is um, a road about three to four miles long, just east of Elkhorn, which is a small, very conservative little town. It's not the sort of place where you would expect to find werewolves. And I remember I laughed when I first heard it. And then I discovered that our county's animal control officer, with whom I'd been working on, and ex- I'd been working with him on an expose he was trying to do on some area puppy mills. Um, told me something rather startling. I asked him if he'd heard of these rumors, and he said, oh, yeah. He said, people have been calling me, and he pulls this manila file folder out of his desk, and the file folder was marked werewolf. That was the label on it, and that got my attention quickly. And then he opened it up, and it it was uh, full of his notes about phone calls people had made and their contact numbers, and he shared those with me. And I was impressed with that because usually if somebody's hoaxing, you know, it's done secretly and they're not sending all their contact info to the local authorities, um, thinking they probably would rather not be arrested. So that was interesting. And when I contacted the people, they didn't seem like they were lying. They came from all different um, diverse backgrounds, um, you know, men, women, young, old, uh, diff- different racial backgrounds, different occupations. And it, it just didn't seem like it was something that could be all due to any sort of a hoax. And I wrote a story for it. It appeared in uh, what a lot of newspapers call that dead zone between Christmas and New Year's when, you know, there's, uh, I, th- I think my other story for that weekend was about the um, elderly couple that played the piano at the nursing home. So, <laughs> you know, and then there was the Beast of Bray Road in the center spread. And, of course, little did we know that it would break out and go nationwide within a couple of weeks. And um, Inside Edition came out and the early sci-fi station show. And I was besieged by um, interview requests from TV and radio from um, one side of the country to the other. It was shocking, almost, you know, more shocking than the beast. And what I realized was that um, the other thing that started happening was people were beginning to get in touch with me and saying, don't laugh, this isn't funny, it's a real thing, I saw it. My wife and I saw it, Um, you know, my my, 
a group of friends that I thought, and I realized it is not only nationwide, but worldwide. I think one of the first letters I got back was uh, from someone in the Virgin Islands who said they had seen something there, very similar. And because um, at the time, really not too many people were looking into this particular sort of creature, um, I sort of became the go-to person for both media when they wanted a story, especially every Halloween. You know, I'm still very busy around, around Halloween, but more importantly, people who had had the same experience and mostly just wanted to tell someone who wouldn't think they were crazy. And I worked at that paper for 10 years, and I finally realized there was, there was other writing that I wanted to do. I had another story. Uh, it was a true crime story called The Poison Widow that I wanted to get published, and I did. And then they came back to me and said, well, what have you got next? And I said, well, would you believe werewolves? Because there was still so much interest in it, it even without my um, pushing it in the slightest. I mean, I wasn't really out there trying to garner publicity of any kind, and people were still coming. So I thought, well, I really ought to write the story of what happened uh, around Bray Road at that time and how it impacted the town and what possible local history there might be to support it and just try to answer all the questions that people had. And lo and behold, the same thing happened. Once that book came out, um, I was besieged again and received so many more that 23 years after the first newspaper story broke, I'm still writing these books. And um, I think this is number 17, the one that's coming out October 11th, um, taking a little bit different look at the creatures than I have before. But... Um, the more that I study them, the more that I hear people's stories, the more that I analyze and compare um, map sightings and, and locations, really the more questions that I have. Um, it's a very diverse phenomenon, which is something that wasn't apparent right away. And it's something that continues to fascinate me because people keep seeing it. And uh, that, that, to me, is the big mystery. Why are all these people, normal, sane, otherwise just ordinary people, seeing something that stands on its hind legs when it oughtn't to do that in nature and looks like what they call a werewolf? In your best estimation, what is the difference between what people are seeing as a dogman and a werewolf? That's a great question that many people never get around to asking because, you know, at face value, um, it does sound like it should be a werewolf. I mean, people would describe it as five to seven feet tall with a head that looks like a wolf or maybe a German shepherd covered with fur. Um, usually they'll see a tail. They'll describe paws with claws, sometimes the paws, in fact, quite often, they'll describe the paws as being a bit elongated, but um, still paws in most cases, not, not all, but most. And the thing is that um, Hollywood werewolves, you know, such as the, you, you, the ones you think of like Jack Nicholson or um, Michael J. Fox or, you know, go back to the great ones of the, the uh, early 20th century, you think of the hair first sprouting. You still got this kind of human-like face. Um, there's ears, but it's not super realistic. There's the silver bullet thing. There's the moon. And all of that is mostly Hollywood. Um, even a lot of the things on the moon, that, that famous um, little poem that even even the man who... Um, is, is good and pure, you know, that, that sort of thing. There's that little verse about it in um, the Wolfman movie. Um, that, that was all made up for the movies. And if you go back to medieval ideas of werewolves, again, you've got all these um, really mystical things that were happening um, with, with the creatures. They would make a certain salve and ointment and then wear the 
skin of a wolf, and, you know, it was like magical practices. And what people were reporting to me, and this is what I really like to stress, is that I really try to go by what people report and not what I think they should be. What people were reporting to me and still report for the most part, probably at least 90% of the time, is something that looks and acts like a true canine. It has yellow golden eye shine um, covered with fur, as the head as I described, big things. Um, it, it looks like it's totally canine, except it's running on its hind legs. And that is not a supernatural thing. If you look on YouTube and Google um, dogs walking upright, you can also find great videos of wolves walking upright or any mammal can walk upright if it's motivated or forced to do to by to do it by say an injured limb or, or forepaw. But they don't in the wild because they're not constructed that way. You know, they don't have um, bears, wolves, dogs don't have shoulders like we do meant to balance and to use our arms and, you know, we, we have these ro- wonderful things called rotator cuffs that allow us to, uh, you know, pitch a baseball and these things don't, but yet they walk upright. And um, I think that from the beginning that was what made me suspect that these were not your great-great-great-great-grandfather's werewolves, you know, that, that there was something else going on. Not that it isn't you know, spooky that they're walking on their hind legs. Um, and I, I won't say for sure that that's just a normal thing because, as I said, I haven't been able to get any kind of proof that they um, do this normally in the wild. You know, it seems to be a behavior that's used for certain effect. I, I don't even know if that's the exact right way to put it. But the, the other thing is they do stare at people with this really creepy look that people will describe as a jeer or a leer or a sneer. And again, this is not a supernatural thing, except it's just really weird. I mean, I don't know anybody who's encountered a wild animal, um, you know, out hunting or um, walking or anything, and looked at it and felt that it was sneering at them as if it were superior. And that's what I hear over and over and over and over and over. So um, that, too, is... And then there's also, you know, where you have um, legends or, uh, say, the Beast of Javadan in France, which was a, a long-running werewolf attack. There were, like, pe- many, many people killed and hundreds of livestock slaughtered. And you'll find um, a pattern where um, people are getting attacked in the traditional werewolf stories and legends. And that is not the case in the ones that I've investigated with this creature. You know, I've heard of a few other incidents here and there where some people, um, you know, have claimed that they, that there were injuries or deaths, but um, I haven't seen that so far. So these are all different ways that um, I think the, the reports given to me over the past 23 years do vary from the traditional idea of a werewolf. Gail wants to know, have you ever seen one, Linda? I believe that I may have seen the spine of one. <laughs> that I started out my book, um, Michigan Dog Man, with with this um, anecdote. I was in Michigan with a History Channel cameraman, and we were out on this very very isolated gravel road. It was about 2 a.m. It was like 95 degrees and almost it was just fixing to rain and storm. It was a very, very creepy, creepy evening. And um, these witnesses had at different times seen two different dogmen out on this road. And the cameraman had a, we had a big floodlight set up on one, on one end of the, the road. And he happened to be turned the other way. I turned around just to look. I think I was thinking something like, yeah, every time the cameraman turns, that's when things happen. And I turned around and looked at where the floodlight was just in time to see something running across the road just behind the reach of the light. So that for just a moment when he entered the road, the light did hit its uh, its spine 
and illuminated it, and what I saw was a vertical spine covered in gray fur. I couldn't see the rest of it because it was obliterated by the shadows. And it ran across the road, and I'm standing there just kind of gasping in disbelief because it's going very fast. And it momentarily blotted out a reflective road sign when it got to the other side of the road, which didn't take very long because it wasn't a very big road. And it would have had to have been seven feet tall in order to have blotted out that road sign. And that's exactly how the witnesses had described one of the creatures that they saw um, as being about seven feet tall with gray fur. And um, the, one of the witnesses saw it at the same time that I did, and then they got very upset and insisted that we leave. They were really frightened, having had their car chased by the creature early, you know, um, a few weeks earlier. So um, that was my closest that I've come to seeing um, the dog man. I've seen um, Bigfoot, yes, yeah, but um, you know, the, I think that the dog men are. I think there are fewer of them, and they're even more elusive than the Bigfoot, and um, they're they're not quite as as bulky. I think it's easier for them to slip around and and hide too. So anyway, that was that was my one possible look at the dog man that I've had. But Part you. But in the bottom of your heart, you believe this animal, creature, whatever it may be, is 100% real. We're not talking about fictitious stories here. Um, no, no, I, I think that there is a phenomenon. Um, now, when you say 100% real, I believe the phenomenon is 100% real, but, um, you know, reality has different gradations, and sometimes there are ranges of reality that people are seeing something, definitely, but I'm not any more convinced that every single report is of a complete flesh and blood animal, um, and, and that's only been arrived at after these many, many, many years of, of collecting the reports and studying them and, and looking at it. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's real to the... I believe that the people who see these things are having real encounters, just as I had a completely real experience seeing that gray-furred spine run across that road. But I don't know what the creatures... I do still do not claim to know for sure what these creatures are. Got a question from Trip for you, and Trip is mm -hmm. asking... What do you think the difference is between the dog man and what are your thoughts are on the loop guru? Well, um, the the loop guru is that you know a French name for uh, that I think was originally applied to the the um, medieval or European traditional werewolf, and that was transferred over to. Um, a lot of the French settlements, the early French settlements around the U.S. and Canada, and in the southern U.S., uh, it's been kind of distorted a little bit to Rougarou. But I think that they're all basically describing the same thing. It's you know something that looks like a wolf and walks upright. And uh, again, I I don't know if uh, I I don't see really a big connection to the the old traditions about it, but I think that that's probably the same creature that they're all describing, is this thing that stands and walks upright on its toe pads and gets around bipedally rather than on all fours. Is it a seasonal creature? And I realize most people aren't wandering the wilderness except for the loyalists who are skiers, hike, maybe the odd hiker, or snowshoer, or depending on where you are in North America. But is this creature seasonal? Do we think it goes into hibernation, or is it seen year-round? It is seen year-round, yeah. Um, the sightings dwindle a bit in winter, but um, they do appear. You know, I mean, people have... I've seen um, footprints in in snow in certain places where um, uh, they go. I, I try to go. You know, I, I obviously can't 
go to every um, single place that every single person who writes to me. But if it's a place that I can get to, and it's within a reasonable amount of time, that it might still be there since the report. Um, you know, I I go out and investigate when I'm able. You know, and I've I've seen some pretty good whopper-sized uh, prints in in snow that appear to be bipedal. Um, you didn't see the other the the four paws anywhere on the ground. So I and I've had people encounter it in the winter too, but the um, really busy season is about mid-August to say um, early December, something like that. I have had one seen in, um, and this was not too long ago, and it was out near Bray Road um, in February when it was like 10 below. I mean, it was just really, really cold. And a farmer was uh, happened to be out in his shed at 3 a.m. trying to fix the machinery or something, and his livestock all started uh, just acting up. And so he looked out, and he saw this coyote going lickety-split, and behind it was something he described as at least five feet tall, maybe more. It was hunched over a little bit as it ran, was running on its hind legs. It had long, shaggy brown fur. And remember, this this is 3 a.m., 10 below zero, in snow. There's no human being that's going to be out chasing a coyote, you know, so I don't think it was any kind of a hoaxer by any means. But, um, you know, th- this this was a pretty, a pretty convincing sighting. And this was also a person, I might add, who had never believed in the whole Beast of Bray Road descriptions, even by people that he knew very well. He thought it was uh, all a bunch of hokum, and he has changed his mind quite a bit. And by the way, in my new book, um, I happen to have a, what I believe is a very good trail cam photo of the coyote that was being chased by that creature. Because oh, the trail very cool. cam had been it's, it's amazing. The trail cam had been set up um, less than a mile away and um, watching these coyotes. And the coyote disappeared from the trail cam about three minutes before this um, creature showed up in the man's yard. Well, we do have to tell everybody to go out there and buy Monsters Among Us when it comes out, and I believe it's coming out within the next month or so. Am I correct on that? Yes, it's coming out October 11th, and you can pre-order it. You can go to lindagodfrey.com, and you'll land on something that tells you all about how to pre-order it if you'd like. And there may be a familiar story from the Space Out Radio parts in that book. (laughs) Just maybe. I wondered if you were going to bring that up. Maybe. Yeah. I, I, you know what? I'm going to gloat because this is the first time <laughs> that I have been quoted in a book, and I am so excited. And Linda drove a hard bargain. I negotiated hard. I said, I will not allow you to do this unless I get an autograph signed copy. <laughs> and, you know, she almost came through the phone at me at that point, but it was, oh, it was nasty and ugly, but we got her done. So, yes, if you're a Spaced Out Radio fan... <laughs> You have to go buy Monsters Among Us because yours truly, Dave Scott's Bigfoot story, is in that book. So make sure you go get it. So, yeah, well, uh, actually, um, I'm thinking it's... Now, is that part of your UFO story? Or is it my we UFO have, story? Was it the UFO, UFO story? Yes, it's the UFO story. Because remember, you gave me the drawing. Of that's right. UFO? That's right. Okay, let me rephrase. It's the UFO story, not the Bigfoot story. The UFO story that is in Linda's new book, Monsters Among Us. <laughs> I have to put the I'll have to put the Bigfoot story in the next one. Well, for sure. You can use anything yes. of mine. I don't mind. But would you want to tell your story? Oh you can no. probably tell it better than I can. No, we're gonna make them buy the book. We're gonna get oh. them to buy the book. <laughs> you know. Okay. That's a good plan. You know, I and I do have to say, I it I was like a when Linda asked me if she could use my UFO story in the book. I I can honestly say that I was like a like a, a kid in a schoolyard that just got to ride the brand new the brand new <laughs> swing or something for the first time. I was so happy and excited about that. It was really cool. Do you mind if we get to some questions from our audience? Not a bit. Awesome. 
Zaber is asking, have you ever heard of any accounts of missing persons in connection with Dogman? I have not, you know, and um, I know that there's, there's, there are one or two stories that are out there because the last few years, you know, Dogman has become very popular and, uh, and actually some of these stories have been around for quite a while too, but, um, People have suggested that perhaps David Polite's books, you know, about missing 411, um, that perhaps it's a dogman taking all these people out of the national parks. But there isn't any evidence. There, there really isn't any proof. And as I said, too, I haven't um, had reports of people really being injured, except for one man in Quebec um, was the only injury, serious injury, that I've had personally reported to me over the years. That doesn't mean there aren't any. It's just that I haven't had them personally reported to me. And even this guy, he was walking on a trail um, somewhere outside of of Quebec and came across an upright canine, which kind of stared at him for a minute and then made sort of a lunge. And he thought it was lunging at him, but he realized later it was lunging to the side to get away, as they almost every single time do. And so it kind of gashed him on his side, and he had to go get stitches. He sent me a picture of the stitched-up scar, which I can't prove was made by a dog man, but somebody, I had a doctor tell me it was consistent with something like tooth marks. And um, that that is the only um, only one that I know of so far, you know, where, where anybody's been injured. Now, um, I'm not sure I'm answering the question very well. Well, you know what? You kind of answered two questions there. You answered Saber's question about if there had been anybody go missing in regards to this, and you've also answered mm-hmm. Gail's question is, do they attack people? Everett, oh, okay. it, Everett is asking, and he's a big fan. When I told him you were coming on the show tonight, he last night, he was like, yeah, i got to be there for that one. So he's <laughs> a big fan of yours. And Thank he. You. And he was asking, Linda, have you ever heard of any reports of a hairless dogman type creature in southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois? Um, I've I've had a couple. Yeah, um, it's not very frequent. There was one up, um, like in central Wisconsin, near the uh, the little Plain River, kind of near Eau Claire, and this was. Um, actually seen in connection with a UFO. The UFO was seen several times, and then this um, certain group of people started seeing this creature. They liked to camp out and just have campfires and that kind of thing, and they'd see it uh, staring at them from the bushes, and then it started following them home. And it, they described it as looking like, sort of like a wolf that would be on its hind legs, but they said it there was no fur, and the skin was all kind of grayish, pinkish gray, oily, which is how animals do look when they have mange. However, I've also been told by some veterinarians that if something had that total of a case of mange, it would probably die. It would be in very, very ill health, you know, without any of its protective fur. Um, So there's been that one. And I've heard of a couple others, too. Uh, You know, there's the exact incidents aren't coming back to me right off the top of my head, but um, yeah, it's not completely unknown. Does this person know of one that I should know about? Or well, you know what? If Everett does, he'll let us know. And That'd be great. Yeah, he definitely will. Gloria has a question. She is asking, "Have you been able to figure out, Linda, how these creatures are multiplying?" Do you have any idea if this is hereditary, how they have their breeding capabilities or anything along those lines? Well, due to the fact that um, I've had what sound like pups rep- reported a couple of times, um, I, I think they, they must have breeding populations unless they're popping in from some other world um, because they've been around for a very long time. The contemporary sightings like that are like the ones I collect um, go back until at least the 60s. I've had a couple back from the 30s. Um, 
and they probably were around before then, but just weren't recognized really for what they were. But I'm, you know, a wolf in the wild lives um, a, a fairly short lifespan, and you know there would have to be many. It, it would have to be one impossibly lived creature if there were only one, and it, you know, lived um, all those many, many decades and even hundreds of years. It, it's just if it's a flesh and blood creature, it must be breathing somewhere somehow. Now, you know, there are theories that um, it and Bigfoot both go to um, both go somewhere else to um, have some unknown part of their lives to us, but they they come to our world to breed and multiply because they're able to. Um, accomplish that better where there's uh, flesh and blood bodies. And, uh, I'm getting this from um, some Native American friends I've talked to. Um, I always stress that Native Americans do not all believe the same thing. They're, um, you know, globally a very diverse, um, very diverse groups of people. It's, you know, so I, I don't want to say, like, this is what every Native American person believes. And um, what, but what, of those that I've talked to, and I've talked to some um, elders, one that was even an elder and an anthropologist, and what I get from them is something like they believe that both of these creatures, the Bigfoot and the Dogman, are primarily and originally spirit animals that lived in a spirit world, but they know where the doorways are to come to our world for certain purposes. And while they're here... They can be um, all or mostly flesh and blood. They will eat for energy. They um, have weight. They leave footprints. They can breathe. They can have babies. Um, and when they want to get back to their own place, they know where to go. And that's why you don't find the dead bodies and why sometimes they're seen as partly invisible and or fully invisible and why many people report that bullets don't affect them. Um, you know, it explains a lot of things, really. It, it, this paradigm explains the totality of the reports much better than anything else that I've discovered. So um, to make a, a good question with a long, long, long answer, um, I, I believe that they do breed here, and I think that the Bigfoot also do. I was just going to ask you that because many people in the First Nations communities out there do believe that Bigfoot is either a shapeshifter or an interdimensional being of some sort. Mm -hmm. And with you were talking about Dogman being that exact same way, as someone who researches on the scientific side of this creature, do you believe there's any possibility that those legends or First Nations theories could be true? Well, when it comes to the spirit world or the other world or what we might call another um, a world in another dimension or something like that, um, yeah, I, I do definitely believe that um, there's a... a and I, I don't have to believe this, but I can see by reading popular physics, type, things like that, I'm not by any means a physicist or a scientist, but... I do try to read these things and, um, you know, understand what what my um, artist brain can comprehend of them. And the the thing that's really surprising, and this has been um, borne out more and more in just the most recent years, is that the most brilliant of our physicists and, and scientists have come up with formulas and equations that show that not only must there be other worlds of some type, you know, and they could argue about the different possible formations of these. They could, they could be um, limited just to 11 other dimensions or they could be infinite, you know, there and, and all things in between. But that these things, um, these, these other places can have interaction with our world. And so far, the equations to prove that um, only refer to like subatomic particles. You know, it, they call it the a micro theory. But 
um, many think that eventually it will be worked out to show that macro or, say, people-sized flesh and blood things can go back and forth too. So uh, I, I think it's gotten to the point where you can say, I don't have to just believe as a person believes in you know, a religious faith without having seen anything. I can look at these equations and say, this is top-range physics, and people smarter than me are saying that this is how the world, if, this, if these other things that are already provable are true, then this must be true as well. And as hard as it is to wrap our heads around that, because, um, you know, it gets very abstract to talk about it, and it's it's very hard to understand, but um, this is what the, you know, the rules of the universe seem to be. So who am I to say, no, I can't see it or smell it or hear it, so it can't possibly exist? Um, You know, I, I think we get into trouble when we, see ourselves as the sum and the end all of all knowledge because I, I know for sure I'm not and um, it it just tells me that there's a good chance that they, they could be coming from what we might call elsewhere, some, some other place that we don't yet have the science to uh, measure or understand fully. Update on what Everett asked about the hairless dogman type creature. He said both his wife and mother-in-law believe that is what they saw in Walworth, Wisconsin. Oh, okay. They well, you know what? and he actually has drawings of what they saw. Oh well, would he please email them to me? <laughs> sure. I, I would really, I'd really like to see those. You can go to LindaGodfrey dot com. And you can rather easily find my email on there. Um, so that that should be easy. If you don't find it right away, go to the uh, About page at lindagodfrey.com. I'd love to see that. Um, yeah, I will tell you, Walworth, Wisconsin is on the just about on the Illinois-Wisconsin border. It's about as southernmost Wisconsin as you can get. In fact, we have uh, a town just beyond it called Bear, Bigfoot which is just over into Illinois, and Walworth um, High School is uh, known as, as uh, Bigfoot High School, Bigfoot High, which is sort of funny. And it doesn't refer to the, to the creature Bigfoot. It refers to the last Potawatomi chieftain to live on Geneva Lake there was named Chief Bigfoot because um, he was seen walking in snowshoes and left these big prints, and so he got the nickname Bigfoot. But uh, I, I digress. What I really intended to um, convey was that that whole state line area, for some reason, is very, very active. I mean, you can you can drive along the um, be, be, the the whole southern border between Illinois and Wisconsin, from the west to the east side, is full of sightings of both Bigfoot and the Dogman. And from about Walworth County to, to the east, they're usually the dog man. And from Walworth County to the west, they are usually the Bigfoot. Not always, but usually. But, yeah, I'm very interested in hearing about that and seeing his sketch. He says he, it may take a couple of days, but he will get that to you. Fantastic. Fantastic. Absolutely. I will really look forward to it. Why do you think Bigfoot is so heavily played in the public eye, yet Dogman people really have a tough time trying to believe? Well, for one thing, Bigfoot is more like us. Bigfoot is an, uh, you know, an anthropoid. It's very human-like. Um, it's much more human than gorilla or, or ape. Um, people who see it, and come face to face, say um, they thought maybe we would think of shooting it, but it just looked too human. They couldn't bring themselves to do it. They felt it would be murder. They have hands instead of paws. They walk flat-footed like we do. Um, they have nails rather than claws. They're like us, and that is really intriguing. You know, to have something that is like us but not us, 
running around just out of our usual eyesight is a very, very intriguing um, proposition, and I think it makes us very curious about them. Um, the other thing, with, you know, on the other side of the coin, when you have the dogmen, um, they have sort of an advantage. They can drop to all fours and run along, and then you would think nothing other than, oh, there was a really maybe kind of um, strange-looking, bulky-looking, big dog wolf thing, but um, you wouldn't think that you'd necessarily see an cryptid. So you can talk yourself out of having seen something really strange. You know, and people also know. I mean, people know that a dog can get up on its hind legs, too. And very often they're seen in both positions during the same encounter by people. So it's not, I don't think that they have quite the same degree of fascination for us. And I think that they're also, again, um, even more elusive, and probably there are fewer of them, and um, the sightings seem to be a lot more rare than the sightings of the Bigfoot. Do you believe, though, that maybe they are hiding it a little bit more and focusing the attention on Bigfoot? It's much like this reminds me so much in a parallel universe to the Roswell crash and the San Agustin crash. Nobody talks about the San Agustin UFO crash, even though it happened literally on the same day as Roswell, just a couple hundred miles away in New Mexico. And it almost seems the same way with Bigfoot. Everybody is so focused on Bigfoot that they either have never heard of Dogman or they just pay no attention to it. Well, that's a good point, yeah. And in fact, for many, many years, and some of these people are just starting to come around now, um, many very highly entrenched Bigfoot investigators and hunters did not want to believe that there was such a thing as a separate creature um, that, as the dog man, they would, they would call it the snouted Bigfoot and just say anything that stands up and is furry has to be a Bigfoot totally disregarding the fact that Bigfoot does not have pointed ears on top of its head. Bigfoot does not have a long wolf-like snout with big fangs. Bigfoot does not walk on its toe pads. It walks flat-footed. Um, and Bigfoot actually weighs quite a bit more, um, much bulkier. They get, they get bigger. And um, there have been a couple of TV shows that I have to mention um, have kind of muddied these waters. In, in a way because um, they haven't always been careful to differentiate between witnesses who are talking about Bigfoot and talking about the Wolfman, and they'll have them in the same show even. And when you've got one witness is saying, well, it weighed, um, you know, four to 500 pounds, and they're talking about the Bigfoot they saw, but that isn't brought out, people get mixed up and um, apply that to the dog man, and which makes it seemed even more fantastical because um, four or five hundred pounds would be impossibly huge for a canine. You know, they're they're estimated usually by the people that see them as um, 150 to at the most, uh, you know, 200 pounds um, because they still have those you know much smaller forelimbs and and uh, you know if you can imagine the sh the shape of a dog's limbs are very different than those of a, a primate. And the Bigfoot, they're just bigger. Do you think, though, that there is a huge difference between the creatures? Yes, we've talked about the First Nations side. Yes, we've talked about the size differential. But what about aggressiveness? Bigfoot seems to want to stay more in the backwoods. Mm -hmm. And really only, from my perspective of things and mine only, he only seems to want to come out if he feels he can trust you, if that makes any sense. You know... Are we seeing a difference in aggression, a difference around people who have close encounters? Well, um, I think that Bigfoot can be aggressive. And, you know, I've had in my own experience, and, uh, oh, boy, wait till you read this one story in Monsters Among Us. It's one of the most um, aggressive Bigfoot attacks that I've ever heard of, and this was from um, a retired math teacher in Chicago who was, attacked by a Bigfoot um, in Schiller Woods just east of O'Hare Airport along the 
the Des Plaines River runs, uh, there's like a natural area running north and south. Many people don't realize there's a, this huge nature corridor that enables things to get around. I actually found wolf prints. They uh, they were uh, quadrupedal and they were the normal size for wolf prints, but they were definitely wolf prints along that um, stretch the day that I went to interview this gentleman. But um, again, I don't want to spoil the story in the book, but um, he was attacked by a Bigfoot that was pulling flat river rocks out of the river bottom and um, flinging them over his head at this man. Um, I've been hiking in an area that where I've had lots of Bigfoot reports with a colleague um, who stands over six feet tall and, and weighs close to 300 pounds himself. And um, I had the brilliant idea of shaking a little tree to see if we could get anything's attention. And being a big guy, my friend was shaking this tree really, really hard. And all of a sudden, a rock flew out of nowhere and uh, conked him in the head. He had a concussion from it, actually. And I have a Native American friend um, in Maine who's had a lot of experience with uh, the forest people, as, uh, as she calls them. And she said, I told her about it, and she said, if it actually hit him with the rock, it meant to kill him, which kind of scares me because then I would have been, <laughs> then I would have been uh, there completely alone. And this, this is a rather desolate part of the... Hell Marine State Forest, um, where I I believe that they actually have a, a small breeding colony, and I think it was saying, you know, quit bothering my territory, and um, I'm not sure if it meant to kill my colleague or not. Maybe not, because maybe it would have used a bigger rock if it meant to do that, but I believe that they can get aggressive. They're not teddy bears. But they also can have um, relationships with people that seem to be um, mutually friendly and and respectful. So, but you don't really know for sure which kind you're getting until you've had some experience. Is the thing if you think about it. So, I wouldn't assume that they're all really really aggressive, um, and I wouldn't assume that they're all really really nice teddy bears. Um, when it comes to the dog man, I think the majority of the people who write me have been really frightened and felt that it was very aggressive and that it would have liked to have attacked them, but for some reason it couldn't or wouldn't or just didn't. Um, but there are others, uh, a smaller number of people, but I do hear from them, who think that they had positive experiences with them and uh, don't feel that they really are as aggressive as others think. It, it could be the area, because I know here in British Columbia, the only real fear that people have for Bigfoot around here that I have researched is for women, they say, especially First Nations women, you do not go out alone at night from dusk onward, because Bigfoot, what they believe here, is short on the female variety of the species. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And yeah. there are reports throughout British Columbia's history where Bigfoot has mm -hmm. come down and taken a wife. Right, and, right. And so that's, I guess, what, what I'm asking about the aggressiveness of the creature, especially as it pertains to Dogman, because the Dogman stories that I have heard before, they seem to be very aggressive. They seem to be wearing some sort of flak jacket to take a bullet you know, or a slug or mm -hmm. something along those lines, mm -hmm. you know, and they seem to be like, like a cat just pissed off because it's Wednesday at 11.42 p.m. Yeah. <laughs> they do appear that way a lot of times to people. Now, I've, I've heard the same thing about Bigfoot, you know, with the bullets bouncing off, too. Um, so they, they share a lot of the same attributes, right, right down to following deer paths and being seen, both of them, um, walking off with hunks of deer or sometimes even a whole deer over their shoulders, you know, so that they have those things in common. And that leads to my belief that another thing they have in common is that they're territorial over their favorite hunting spot because I think they both depend on deer for protein 
and any predator who has good hunting grounds, I mean, people are the same way. Men will defend their um, favorite fishing holes and uh, keep their favorite hunting spot secret. You know, if you've got a, a good source of protein, that's um, life to a predator. So um, I think that you could explain part of it as being kind of a, a, a bluff defense to make people stay away from um, food sources and breeding grounds. We only have less than a minute before we're going to hop out and take our first break. Once again, maybe remind us in our audience when Monsters Among Us is going to be coming out. That's October 11th. It'll be released. You can pre-order. Uh, just go to lindagodfrey.com and you can see how to do that. That's awesome. And don't forget, Dave Scott's story on the UFOs is going to be in there. It's on it the is. UFO landing. That's what it is. It's on the UFO landing that I saw. And there we go. We're going to hop out for a break right now. We'll be back right after this. More Linda Godfrey in hour number two on the mighty SOR. Looking for news beyond the mainstream news? Head to spacedoutradio.com and check out the SOR Spacewire. This is Spaced Out Radio's Eric Markham, news director for the SOR Spacewire. Daily, I will bring you intriguing stories and outlandish reports from what's going on around the world. UFO sightings, paranormal activity, conspiracies, alternative health, and so much more. And if you have news, email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Hi there. I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphorcop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com. Have you had an experience you can't explain? Had a run-in with ghosts, maybe Bigfoot, or seen lights in the sky? Hi, I'm Mike Schmidt from the SOR Sight Lines. I'm here to investigate your sighting. Head to spacedoutradio.com and fill out a report on the sight lines. All your information is 100% confidential, and I will help you figure out what you've been seeing. File your report, and let's find out the answers together. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com from Mothman to Frogman and everything in between. Hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. From British Columbia to Northern California, Pacific North Weird has Cascadia covered. Check out our feature videos at spacedoutradio.com where I, Vincent Zunza, and my super sleuth partner, Alexandra Sullivan, track down the weird and strange stories from around the Pacific Northwest from Bigfoot to Mel's Hole and everything in between. This is what makes life exciting. So why report the normal when we can report the Pacific North Weird? Right here at spacedoutradio.com. Oh, there's only one way to rock. Loud and proud. In high definition. 
Radio 702 Rocks, Las Vegas. Have you ever had an extraterrestrial experience? One you just couldn't explain? Well, maybe I can help. Hello, I am Samantha Mullet. On the second Tuesday of each month, I will join Dave Scott on Space Out Radio to bring a human aspect to ET contact. It's something I've lived with my entire life, and I'd love to help you understand. Let's share our experiences. The ET Experience, the second Tuesday of each month, only on Space Out Radio. Hi there, this is Jolene with Reveal It Reiki and Readings, and I want you to relax. Let me help you chill out and get in touch with your body, mind, and soul. In this busy world, sometimes we need to let go, and this is where I can help. Visit my website, rivuletrnr.wix.com forward slash rivuletrnr. Every Saturday and Sunday night, as Dave Scott wanders aimlessly in the wilderness, you can come hang out with me, James Tyson, and Spaced Out Weekend. Starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, I'll take you along as we talk with some of the best experts in their fields. SpacedOutRadio.com is the place to find us. So sit down, relax, put your feet up, enjoy the topics like the paranormal, supernatural, intuitiveness, and so much more. Hope to see you there. Hi there, this is your psychic medium, Joanna, and I would love it if you would join us every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. With host James Tyson, we'll bring you personal psychic messages on two mediums and a large. Questions about love, life, career changes. We would love it if you would come and join us live. Call in and listen in for the experience. Allow us to open the doors to your other side. Two mediums and a large. Heard only on Space Out Weekend at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to become one of our space travelers? All you have to do is click on the space travelers icon at spacedoutradio.com. For only $5 a month, you can get access to some great prizes, as well as private monthly shows, newsletters, and a members only section on our website. Become a space traveler today. Do you have a topic or a guest that you'd like to hear on Spaced Out Radio? Let us know at spacedoutradio.com where you can sign up to become a Space Traveler member today. Or you can find us on Twitter, at Spaced Out Radio, and on our Facebook page, Spaced Out Radio Show. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio. Tonight I am your host, Dave Scott. We are back in the hot seat here of Uncle Jimbo's cabin. Bill Cardwell has set the password for the SOR Space Travelers tonight. It is gargantuan. If you're an SOR space traveler, gargantuan is your password. Make sure you use it wisely. If you're wondering what it's for, exactly. Gargantuan is your password. Make sure you use it wisely. Tomorrow night on the show, Chuck Montana will join us. He is a whistleblower. We're going to talk about Los Alamos. Is there time travel really there? Let's find out in the New Mexico desert tomorrow night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern time. Remember, if you are listening in on Revolution Radio, it is... The only station out there for you. It is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Do us a favor. Head to freedomslips.com and donate today. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like. Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. Listen to us on TuneIn. You can download our podcasts on iTunes, and our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club. It's only five bucks a month. Read up on our latest blogs. They're posted weekly. Check out the SOR Space Wire. Our music band, the guitar god Ron Bumblefoot Thal, who takes care of all of our music. And if you've had an experience, we have now added added the SOR Sightlines Report. So if you've had a weird experience that you can't explain, you want it investigated, fill out the sidelines, Sightlines Report. We will get an expert to call you, take your information, and we'll figure out someone to come give you a hand in figuring out what you've seen. It's just that simple. Everything at spacedoutradio.com. lindagodfrey.com is Linda's website, as she is the queen of dogman research. We bring her back for the second hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Linda, welcome back. Glad to be back. Thanks. I'd like to start off with getting a few more questions in from our audience, if you wouldn't mind. No, not at all. Okay, let's start off with Sabre. He is asking, what aspects, Linda, of Dogman or Werewolves do you think Hollywood actually gets right in their movies? 
Well, it depends on the movie. Um, <laughs> you know, there there are some uh, some some movies where they're far more realistic. Um, I think the the Wolfen, you know, um, Stephen King's series. They probably seem more. People have described them to me as reminding them of the the ones portrayed in the Wolfen. Um, Dog Soldiers is another one where people felt that they were more uh, more realistic. But then you know you can run the whole gamut um, from the ones that are just kind of silly, you know, like the the Teen Wolf, to the ones where they're um, just nothing but grade B horror, you know, like the, there's a movie called The Beast of Bray Road, which I had nothing to do with. Um, with they, they just used the name from my book and kind of made it up, but it's basically, um, you know, eight or nine different ways that a werewolf could kill you by, you know, tearing you apart, you know, eating you different ways, um, all kinds of just real fun things to look at. So the movies, it, you, you can't really talk about them as, as one entity because they run the gamut from silly to way more gruesome than it is ever experienced by people to um, somewhat reasonable-looking creatures, but they, they still don't really act the same way, you know. So I, they're, they're entertaining. The movies are entertaining, but you can't take them like they're a National Geographic special, put it that way. Don is asking, do these dogmen make a certain sound or call that someone should listen for in the forest? Well, that's another great um, comment because, you know, in movies there's always the classic um, howl that these things are supposed to make, but um, people have reported hearing eerie howls in the woods in areas where these... um, sightings have taken place and where there have been footprints. But you never know for sure if they're making the howl. You assume if they're canine that they can and will howl. But the times people have come to me and said that they heard it making a noise, um, and I've had different people in different parts of the country describe the same sound um, to me on in a phone interview or in person. Um, it's a variable pitched growl, which is it's sort of like a growl that can rise to the pitch of a howl, but then it goes back down. They remind me of um, home cappuccino makers. If anybody's ever had, there was a fad for those, you know, maybe 10, 20 years ago where um, people I knew had cappuccino makers in their, their house and it would kind of go, you know, it would be way up high, way down. Very different than... You know, you just hear a dog growling or a, or even a wolf growling. It was kind of a very unique and distinctive um, howling growl, is maybe a way to put it. So, And I, and I think that's different from um, what people would say about Bigfoot or just about any other uh, known canine. Eric is asking... Linda, have you ever heard of the vampire beast of Bladenboro here in North Carolina? And do you see similarities in the eyewitness and forensic evidence? Um, Yeah, I actually uh, did some research on the beast of Bladenboro. um, And it's in my book, um, American Monsters, which was my most recent... That was out two years ago. That was my um, most recently published book. And the thing with the, the Beast of Bladenboro had a lot of, uh, of scary attributes to it, but um, it didn't necessarily seem to me, you know, that it was seen running around on its hind legs, um, which was what you kind of have to have to uh, qualify as a dog man. But um, I'm trying to recall up some some facts here. It was, um, I want to make sure I have this right. Yeah, some people describe them as dog cats. They were very muscular. Um, they had, in fact, some people uh, describe them as um, 
Brownford. Um, it was a monster that terrorized the whole town in North Carolina in January 1954, um, killed local dogs and livestock, and it left its prints were cat-like, which is unusual because if you if you learn tracking at all and you get to know what, say, a mountain lion tracks look like, they'll look very different to you than will a wolf or than from a, a wolf or a dog. They're much rounder and you know, have just different shapes. Um, they were described as being about 100 plus pound, pounds um, with a sort of cat-like face on a very muscular body. The height on all fours was from two to four feet. So that's pretty high. You, you know, if, you, if you're picturing um, if it's to the top of the head or even to the shoulders. And they would... Uh, attacked not just farm animals, but other dogs. And three dogs killed in one night had their heads flattened like griddle cakes, and their bodies were drained of blood. And that, that's where the vampire thing comes in. So they've also been likened to the chupacabra, um, you know, which would prey on all sorts of, of uh, animals, too, you know, and, and drain the blood. Um, but it's interesting that it has these cat-like features because the, uh, you know, felines and canines are quite different. They can't interbreed. And yet I have had reports of what people will call dog cats or one is, in one case they call it the Doberman lynx um, coming in too. And um, I've got more on that also in the uh, American Monsters book. It's kind of like um, the the lines between the species tend to blur when you get these cryptids, which should not be possible. We know that these are two different, um, that cats and dogs are two different to breed in the flesh, but um, people are always introducing the possibility of modern genetics research, maybe, um, you know, creating by splicing and dicing genes to have something that bears both um, types of features. Or if you go back to the multi-dimensional, many worlds theory, um, the spirit world, what have you, well then you could see perhaps we're dealing with something that doesn't operate by our normal um, genetic code laws and that they could be um, gradations of one into the other. So. Um, that that's kind of how I viewed that beast of, of Bradenboro, and they did they did actually um, shoot a bobcat, which isn't nearly as bobcats are not nearly as big as what was described by most people, and um, someone else around that time and place claimed to have killed a large spotted cat-like animal that weighed between 75 and 90 pounds, still not huge. And um, the mayor was supposed to display that uh, what the hides of one of them on the town flagpole, but they couldn't really prove that these cat-like animals were the actual beasts of Bladenboro, other than the fact that the killings did stop then. So does that answer the question that they I were think, hoping to hear? Or? I think it does, and Eric actually says... It seems to have made a reappearance in Lexington, North Carolina, just a couple of years ago, too. Hmm. That could very well be. These things do tend to pop up. You know, they'll go away and then they'll come back very often when you have these flaps of sightings like that. Everett is asking a question. Linda, people say that Bigfoot has signs that it is in an area like wood knock, smells, grunting, Etc. Does Dogman give off any clues when it's around? Um, not in the way that the Bigfoot does. And I've actually experienced the, the rock clicking and um, being scent slimed and, you know, some of these other things with Bigfoot, it's quite shocking when it happens to you and, and very unmistakable. With the Dogman, they tend to kind of lurk. You know, people will see, like, the eye shine in 
in the bushes. That was actually what was happening that night in Michigan um, that I described in the beginning of the show. We were seeing the kind of glowing yellow lights in the bushes and things like that, but they they stay out of sight. They're more likely to um, kind of pace you from behind some underbrush where you can hear them a little bit once in a while, but when you stop, they stop. Um, they're, they seem to be much more stealthy um, than the Bigfoot. Although I think, um, I, I've heard it said, and I think it's probably true, that in most cases, um, if you see one or the other, they've allowed it because they're able to be really still, hide hide a lot. Um, the thing with the Bigfoot is they do tend to make these structures out of tree branches um, that they use either maybe for shelter or um, I think of them as, as hunting blinds. I think there's a, a good... And, and also insignia uh, toward one another. They'll, make, they'll tie saplings down to form arches, and they'll make huge... X's out of branches up in the tree too. Um, that almost always, when I've seen them, tend to be at natural entry points into a thicker part of the woods or something like that, as if saying, "No, don't come in this part. This is mine." And you don't see that sort of thing with with the uh, the dog man. They'll leave prints, but they don't really have hands. They don't have opposable thumbs. It's harder to you know hold a rock, much less throw it, and um, you know, I think they're more limited by their physiology than the Bigfoot are. So, you know, those would, those would seem to be the major difference. However, um, the dogmen are often reported as having a terrible smell, like the worst dog urine, filthy dog smell that you've ever smelled, maybe mixed with some sulfur. And I've smelled that actually, too, when I've been um, in a field where... Um, a property owner was leaving bait out, and there were very fresh, large canine prints around, and we smelled that, and, and it almost made you gag. It was very, very uh, noticeable. So what you're saying is Dogman needs a shower, much like Bigfoot does. <laughs> well, yeah, they they both, I don't think either of them smell like delicate flowers to us. Um, so, And that's probably to be expected. Besides the Wisconsin, Michigan area, have we seen dogman start to spread across North America? Because I haven't heard too many sightings besides one that you told me about a year ago that was just outside of Calgary, Alberta. Is it coming more west coast where there's a lot more mountains and a lot more trees and fo- and forests and you know a lot of open area between cities? Um, oh, yeah, it's all over the U.S., um, California to Maine, the dog man is, and down into South America, up into Canada, and I think they've always been there. Um, I think that they aren't necessarily spreading. It's just that word is spreading among people. And so when you when you think that you've, you're the only person who ever saw this weird canine running on its hind legs, and then suddenly you hear about it on the radio, they listen to the Dave Scott radio show, or um, hear about it somewhere else, they're able to report it. And I think modern media um, has brought this out to the point where more people are learning. There are people to go to to talk about it. They're more aware that these creatures can exist, so they aren't in denial. I think a lot of people who encounter these things deny it to themselves. It's like, I'm not going to admit that I saw that. I must, my eyes must have deceived me, you know, that kind of thing. And um, therefore, it's, that's another reason it doesn't get talked about as much. So I think it's more of an atmosphere of acceptance that people feel they're able to talk about these things. They're more aware of them. They're more likely to recognize that they're seeing something like this instead of telling themselves that it must have been a bear or maybe a deer reaching for a leaf or something like that. So um, I think that's it more than the fact that these creatures are um, all of a sudden just just spreading everywhere. I think they've always been there. There are just the human populations up. You know, um, use of our national parks in both 
in Canada, the U.S., and everywhere is um, just increasing hugely, you know, to the, the point where these things are almost crowded, and the creatures are far more likely to be discovered when you've got lots more people out and about all of our wilderness areas. So that's what I think it is. Okay, on a humorous side, if you're traveling in the forest now, do you bring a bag of tennis balls just in case, <laughs> you know, you got to throw one. If it comes at you, just throw <laughs> one, get its attention, so that way you can get away. You know, so I, I know people who um, advocate bringing toys and balls and things like that um, just to leave around in areas where Bigfoot are on the hopes that yes. they'll come They'll come and play with them and, you know, kind of be lured in. Um, for the dog men, I, you know, not so much. Um, they, they don't seem like they would probably be attracted by maybe a nice steak or a nice roadkill raccoon. You know, if you flung that at them, they'd probably enjoy that more, I would suspect. Are dog men seen in Bigfoot territory? Or is it something much like a lot of big cats do or big animals do as they spray down their territory and Mm -hmm. they don't intertwine with each other? Um, Well, kind of yes and no. Um, This is something that I've studied right from the very beginning uh, for 24 years around southeastern Wisconsin, mapping out where Bigfoot sightings are and where the Dogman sightings are. And they generally seem to like the same areas where there will be lots of deer, but they also seem to sort of have their territories marked out where um, you can draw a certain diagonal line along the um, north, north to south, northeast to southwest um, parts of the Kettle Moraine State Forest, and almost all of them to the west to a cert- up until a certain point will be Bigfoot, and almost all of them to the east will be the dogmen, with exceptions. I think they make incursions onto each other's territory. If one of them is running after a real great deer, um, they're not going to stop just because they go, uh-oh, this is, this is a dogman, I'm going to leave this alone, I think they'll keep running. You know, And they are occasionally, but um, looking at my big map that I've got um, on my, my office wall, you know, I can see the line really clearly. I've got some green, you can tell where the green pins are and where the red pins are. Um, and you'll notice I mentioned uh, on the state line between Illinois and Wisconsin that um, east of Walworth County or so, they seem to be more of the dogmen, and west it will usually be the Bigfoot. So uh, I think that they keep their own territories. They sometimes mingle, you know, when it's expedient for them to do so and they think they can get away with it. And again, I'm just speculating based on, on you know, what I see by mapping. Um, but I do believe that they have and defend their own territories, as, you know, as best they can, uh, much like any other predatory animal. So you wouldn't see them actually, you know, fighting has that ever been reported where a bigfoot and a dogman have come together um i've i've heard reports of one incident um that i you know i don't like to talk about incidents that i haven't personally investigated there was supposed to have been one such skirmish um somewhere and i'm even i'm blanking out on where exactly it was i'm thinking it was like in kind of one of the mid-southern states in the U.S. But I've never had anybody in 24 years and the hundreds and hundreds of reports. And mind you, I still get reports every week. I've never had one that said they saw both together in the same area. Now, I know of a spot where there's a field where I've seen both Bigfoot prints and Dogman prints, and I've had them both reported by different witnesses who didn't know one another um, but not at the same time, you know, not like uh, running together or fighting or anything like that. They, they were at different times and, and uh, uh, you know, without the other, the tracks weren't directly correlated either. 
it wasn't like one like they were walking side by side according to the tracks. If you know what I mean, they were just they were separate. What do their footprints look like? Well, that's another great question because they again help you determine which one you're looking at. Um, Bigfoot looks vaguely human. They have what is called the mid-tarsal break, which gives them a flexibility in the center of their foot that we don't have as humans and gives them a slightly different gait. But you can see toes. Um, you won't you won't see the... They don't have claws. They have broad um, nails like we do that can be... I've heard some describe them when people would get a fairly close look. They'd say that it looked like their nails had kind of grown out and they, you know, were... Uh, had, had one had cracked off to look pointed or sharp or something like that, but they weren't they weren't really uh, claws. So, and they'll generally be like um, I've seen what I think was a juvenile one that was about eight inches long and four inches wide. You know, it would have been really the wrong proportions for a human foot. Um, they've been measured. The the adults what may range from sixteen to twenty five inches. Um, depending on the size of the creature. Um, when it comes to the dogmen, they usually will look like a very large wolf print, maybe five to six inches, which is large for wolf print. And you can tell because you'll see the claw marks at the end of the toe pads. Now, if it's very soft ground or mud or sand where um, they're not quite on such firm footing, the the hock joint, which would be analogous to like our heel and ankle joint, which would normal normally be up above the ground because they walk on their toe pads, as I keep saying, um, like other canines, um, that joint will be kind of if they're walking on their hind legs, um, that joint will kind of be forced down now and then, especially if they want to kind of rear back to spring after something, and I've gotten footprints. Uh, I've got photos of footprints like these where you could tell it was jumping out of a big uh, mud area to spring after a deer. You could see the, the deer hoofs dig in and then jump out to it, it's like, just like the story in the mud. And you can still see the front toe pads and the claws, but then there's this extra print that would look sort of like a heel, um, uh, you know, coming into contact with the mud a few inches um, behind the other ones. So um, it's still very different than the big, big footprint, but um, you know, it can look either of those two ways. I'm just thinking, print. yeah, I'm just thinking out there because I'm going to be starting some Bigfoot investigation around my area in the central part of British Columbia because there's really nobody up here doing that. And I figure, mm. you know what? What the heck? Great. I I have yeah. the odd odd couple of hours, and I mean, I only have to travel literally ten minutes to get into the deep forest, you know. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's it totally surrounds my entire area, and add to the fact that there's a lot of paranormal and other sightings of of UFOs and Bigfoot, like I said, around this area. It just seems something naturally to do to go along with the radio show. And mm -hmm. I talked to a First Nations member yesterday about this, as a matter of fact, because I knew you were coming on. And they have a plethora of sighting areas around this area within an hour of here where they have seen and spotted Bigfoot on numerous occasions. And they've seen a lot of grizzly bears in those areas too, but but no dogman. But no dogman, and uh -huh. that that kind of, you know, it kind of caught me off guard because I expected to get that weird look that most people who are in the know but don't say anything usually give you, which is mm -hmm. that look of shocked when you're like, oh, you know about that. But she was like, no, mm -hmm. I've never even heard of that. Hmm. Really well. If they just may be, if there are grizzlies and there are Bigfoot, they just may prefer a different territory. And I do think that um, depending on the terrain, uh, it seems that in general, and this is, you know, a, one of those rules that's meant to be broken, but in general, the dogmen seem to 
prefer a little flatter ground. I think um, maybe some, sometimes I think that's perhaps why they seem gathered around the Great Plains, Great Lakes state because, uh, you know, there were the great prairies. Um, and the Bigfoot seemed to like variation in the, um, they like to have the, the hills, ups and downs of the hills, and I think that's why they like the Kettle Moraine State Forest, which is made up of these deep, round um, formations called kettles. They look just like the kind of old-fashioned kettle you set on a, a campfire, and um, they're, it's kind of like having little hills and valleys all over the place, and they and that's what they seem to prefer. And, the, and the, where I draw the lines for the dogmen around here, it's the flatter area where it used to be prairie. So maybe maybe that terrain is not their cup of tea either. You know, it's probably a combination of of both. If there's, you know, a lot of uh, things that are lots bigger than them, and the territory isn't exactly to their liking, they probably just go where they're more comfortable. That makes sense to me. That totally makes sense. It's a, it's a very easy approach to take things because comfortability in the area they have to know their area they have mm-hmm. to know their terrain and with the mountainous side bigfoot it seems finds it easier to be here because it's easier for a bigger yeah. creature like that to hide especially in the thicker old growth forests right exactly yeah and the pi- and and also the the bigfoot are also usually more associated with the pines and the dogmen are more with the the deciduous forest, you know, so that's another generalization that, again, there are always exceptions, but um, it helps you kind of figure out what's most likely to be in one place or another. How many sightings a year are we getting on Dogman? Wow, that's, it's hard to say now that, um, you know, there are more people collecting the reports, there are more, um, you know, there are radio shows that, on them and, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's really hard for me to keep track. Um, I used to get um, probably, well, if I would get one, one to three a week, you know, that's 52 weeks a year. So it could be, I, I would estimate, I used to get just me, um, probably between 75 and 100, sometimes more, sometimes much more. It would depend. Um, But now I I don't know. It's really hard to keep track of them all. So, um, and and that number could could keep going up too. I I don't know. It's it's a very hard thing to to track exactly. Are there a lot of reports coming out of new areas that kind of make this exciting again? Because I can understand where mm-hmm. you get a new report out of Wisconsin or Michigan where you're used to this. But let's say all of a sudden a report comes out of the territories in Canada or Alaska or you're getting something along the Texas-Mexico mm-hmm. border where there's never been. It's more chupacabra down there. Does that get your blood boiling and get you a little excited when those <laughs> new reports come in? Yeah, I mean, I've been getting a lot more from um, different parts of Canada, and um, most recently, Southern California, and actually even one in uh, Northern California. California, for a long time, I hadn't heard anything from. So it's kind of exciting to to um, get these, and they sort of have their own flavor, too. You know, there, there seem to be some regional um, differences. Uh, California, Southern California is where I'm getting these um, dog cats, creatures, that, as people call them. Um, and also, when I do get, you know, I'm, I mentioned right in the beginning of the show that while the largest percentage of sightings don't really portray the creatures doing anything that isn't um, possible within the limits of, of our um, physical world, there's another subset of them that do, you know, and either they're... Um, Sometimes they're transforming they're, or shape-shifting. Sometimes they're um, kind of fading out of, of view. They're doing things that make you know that these are either some type of phantom or a multidimensional visitor. And Southern California, again, is where I've been getting some of these. And I document these. My, my new book, not to keep bringing that up, but 
I did want to really mention that the reason for this latest book coming out is that I have been getting these types of sightings where um, they either involve a, a creature that is displaying what we might call paranormal or supernatural or otherworldly characteristics or is um, connected with um, some type of anomaly like UFO, um, strange lights, um, telepathy, or that sort of thing. So um, th- that's why the, there's a big, long subtitle to the Monsters Among Us book. It's called An Exploration of Otherworldly Bigfoot, Wolfman, Portals, Phantoms, and Odd Phenomena. And what I'm starting to think is that these things just cannot be all unrelated. Um, they do show up in relation to one another far more often than, than you would think. And um, that's, that's what this book sets out to explore. I would love to get into some Canadian sightings, if you don't mind, because, you know, this being in my back door and my mm-hmm. backyard, I would absolutely love to hear a couple of stories from this area. The one story I do recall is the hunter outside of Calgary who had a run-in with one. Has there been a lot since then? Um, I Well, I had one fairly recent one uh, within the past year. Um a man who, this happened in, uh, outside Bancroft, Ontario, and um, this man and a couple of friends were in a hunting cabin, and, um, well, he had, excuse me, he, he has a cabin with a couple of friends, but he went there with him, by himself, uh, to go fishing, and uh, he was out there with a Toyota 4Runner, and, um, I can just maybe share a, a little bit of this with you in, in his words. And he said he has a, a four strong lights and two fog lights, and when I turn them on, it's like daytime. And he didn't have them on yet and could see about 50 yards ahead of him what he thought was a person in the middle of the road, slowing down to almost a stop and getting closer. And he he was wondering, you know, why someone would have been out there on that road at that time of of uh, day when it was uh, almost when it was quite dark. He gets up to 20 feet, realized it's not a person. Put his lights on, and he said, "I can still see this image in my mind right now. It was a creature about seven feet tall, black with gray silver parts, hunched over, with a dead rabbit in its hands, but it had." It, he describes it as fingers and claws, and that's, again, what I call the elongated paws. You know, you can see the claws. The paws are longer, like they're almost fingers. Um, as far as I could tell, its feet seemed to be bent backwards. That means that it was on its toe pads. Um, the backwards-looking part is the hock or the heel and ankle area that I, I described earlier. So we know it's not a big foot or a human because they can't, Worked that way. Um, it turned its head and shoulders and looked right at me. I could see its yellow eye shine. That's the canine color of eye shine. Most people who see a Bigfoot eye shine will say it's bright orange or reddish orange or red. Um, he was. He said, I was close enough to hear a low, low growling. The sound and sight made every hair in my body stand up and still does. And he just hit the gas and got out of here. And this guy is actually one of those who um, compared it to the movie Dog Soldiers. He said that's what it looked like. And this is actually also on my blog. If you go to lindagodfrey.com, um, you can scroll down a little bit to it, and you'll, you'll come to, I put the picture of the Dog Soldiers that they used on their movie poster to kind of illustrate it. And imagine just meeting one of those on a dark road um, <laughs> you know, with uh, five miles from your cabin, that is a pretty frightening thing. I'm scrolling down looking at those right now. Eerie, eerie stuff. Yeah. Do, have there ever been any samples of hair or scat 
or something along those lines, maybe a torn up carcass of an animal said to be ripped apart by Dogman. Have we found any of that like we have with Bigfoot? Um, yeah, I've had, well, I've had people send hair to me um, that they thought was possibly from a, a dog man, and it just seemed to be coincidental in the same place where there was a sighting. Um, one was pulled off a, a car bumper, but I'm pretty sure it was deer. Um, another one actually was analyzed at a lab and was um, determined to be from some type of a big cat. So they haven't really played out as as even being from a canine. Now, I do know of a recent incident where there's an... I'm not going to get into this too much again because it wasn't my research, but um, I I recently heard of somebody else who was able to get scat and fur and was um, taking taking it to have it analyzed. I haven't heard how that went yet. Um, But the thing is, if these are completely canine animals that have somehow... Um, adapted to be able to walk and run on their hind legs when they want to, um, but they're still completely canine, you could get all the fur and scat that you wanted, and it's still going to come out as some sort of unknown canine. Maybe not even unknown. You know, maybe it'll show... I suspect that it might... uh, that if these are natural animals, that they're probably a wolf and dog hybrid of some type. And... Um, in that case, you'll have both wolf and um, uh, dog genetic genetic material showing up, but you won't be able to prove that it was seen that that it was walking upright just from the hair and the scat. Now, Bigfoot is quite different. If you get those things from a Bigfoot, and um, I know that this has been done, in, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm not going to get into the cases, but there have been people who try this and who have come up with um, unknown. But if you have a large unknown primate in North America, anywhere in North America, U.S., Canada, or, or anywhere around here, then you know you've got something unique and unusual because there aren't supposed to be any in this part of the world. And um, it, uh, it's interesting to um, imagine that perhaps there would be some uh, human intermixture with it. It's it's hard to say. But it would be very, very different. Again, much closer to us than the dog man. So um, just another way in in which you can can say the the dog man and and the Bigfoot would be very different in this respect. One, you know what you've got. Um, Even if it says unknown primate, you know it's, it's the primate. And the other one, would probably show up canine, I would guess. I think that would be interesting to find some statistic on that. A lot of people believe that people who have sent information in on Bigfoot for scientific evaluation, they feel that a lot of times that information gets lost or thrown out accidentally, and there's a whole conspiratorial side to that. Do you buy into that theory, maybe with Dogman, from people who have sent samples in, or do you think we're just, you know, so quick to jump on the conspiracy theory that we'll think anything's a conspiracy? Um, no, I I think there's um, definitely something to the idea of these things um, not wanting to be admitted by authorities. And when you say send in, I, I assume you're, you're meaning sending them in to um, law, either law enforcement agencies or, um, like, uh, we have the... University the laboratories or something like yeah. that. Yeah, um, the Department of Natural Resources, that sort of thing. Um, I have two very good friends who are um, uh, they're sheriff's deputies in a different county than I live in. And between the two of them, they've seen four dogmen um, while on their rounds when they have late-night shifts. And uh, they're actually in the new book, too. I have, they have seen quite a few interesting things. And they say they can't go um, to their superiors and really tell them about these things. Um, the official thing that they're told is, 
to go somewhere and say, well, I invest- I went there, I looked around, I didn't see anything. And that's what you usually get. Not always. Um, I think more and more I'm, I'm starting to hear stories of some law enforcement officers who are more willing to, um, you know, investigate and are, will privately talk to witnesses and be a little bit more affirmative. But um, I have uh, on occasion, well, I'll give you one example. Um, there was supposedly a really interesting Bigfoot sighting in Clark County in central Wisconsin um, a couple years ago, and um, I called the, um, a, a few different places in that county. I had some questions about it, um, talked to the sher- a sheriff's deputy there. They weren't very friendly about it. They were trying to say that it was a person in a ghillie suit, even though the eyewitness had a very good close look at it. And then they tried to say, well, it was probably somebody stealing ginseng, um, that kind of thing. So um, I persisted a little bit. Well, the day after I talked to this sheriff, um, it happened to be a Saturday, and my husband and my little grandson and I were all in our living room looking out the picture window, which looks down toward a whole big system of kettles, and we heard this um, helicopter really loud, and it came up over the tree line from where down where these... these uh, kettle formations are, and totally buzzed my house. And it was an unmarked helicopter. It was much too low to have been legal. And I couldn't help but think, sure, that could be coincidence, but um, it's the only time that's ever happened. We thought it was going to take the roof off our house. Literally, that's how low it was. Was it connected? I don't know. But it does make you start thinking in that direction, and then to have actual law enforcement personnel um, tell me this was their directive that was said to them. Now, I, I think that's, I think it's a lot easier to accept the conspiracy theory just to the point where you can say they don't want it out in the public a lot. Where the conspiracy theory gets a little um, thicker is what their reason there. Some believe it's because the creatures, they know the creatures are real and they're hiding them and they're, the government's all in on it and the government's created them. But there is another side of it, too, that's very practical that I also know from um, my friends who are in law enforcement, not just those but others, where they say, you know, it's, it's the pain in the rear end to have these kinds of things show up because what happens is then hundreds and hundreds of people come we suddenly have issues with crowd control. Um, if this is a real creature, we have to worry about it getting shot. If it turns out that somebody gets one and um, it's a new species, we have to protect it. There uh, will be all kinds of expensive programs. They have to be collared. Um, we have to look out for it ourselves. Um, expense, you know, it, it will take more manpower. Those kinds of things um, are, are on the practical side, and, and you can see why they would want to avoid those. A lot of people feel that the reason why the government has never come out, whether it's in Canada or the U.S., they've never come out and admitted that there is Bigfoot, or in this case, Dogman, because then all of a sudden, like you said, you're going to have a bunch of trigger-happy people running into the forest because mm-hmm. they want that that Bigfoot head, to, well, much right. like a moose head, hanging off their wall. Do you see well, that type of thing. Do you see that type of epidemic happening if they were to say make make more protected land areas because this is a Bigfoot area or this is a Dogman area? Yeah, they would kind of have to. I mean, that actually is is a huge thing. This safety issue. Um, I've, you know, I've had people contact me and say they're coming to Bray Road, which is like, you know, four miles of little family farms and fields. There's no big spooky woods there. They'll go, where, where can, I'm, you know, I've got my automatic, I've got my camel, where can I come and camp out, you know, and I'm going to track this thing down and kill it. And I'm like, really? We don't know what it is. Why, why would you kill it? I, you know, I, I, that sort of logic escapes me. It's not killing any people. Um, it's been around for a long time, and it's been many other places 
um, and encountered many other places. Same with the Bigfoot. Why would you kill something when you don't know what it is? If it is a real species, uh, let's let's say that it's an adapted wolf, that the the dogmen are adapted timber wolves. Um, they're highly protected species. You can't go and just shoot one without a permit. Um, you know, you'd be in the very you could get your vehicle impounded and in uh, the U.S. I don't know what they do in Canada, but um, you have a big fine and that sort of thing. If it's a Bigfoot and it's something that's almost human or is maybe some different type of human, you may have committed murder. Um, if you're a hoaxing and trying to make fun of it and you're running around in a ghillie suit like this guy in Montana a few years ago ran out on the highway in a ghillie suit and got run over by two cars, it can be dangerous to your own health. You can get shot at. Um, hoaxers have been shot at. Um, people will tr- will drive around these areas where these things are reported with their shotguns out the window um, in any part of the country. You know, stereotypes about one area of the country doing this over another don't always hold. Um, people just sort of go go wild. So, yeah, there are, there are lots of reasons. But they would, I mean, if they were found to be new species that we could identify that had their own territories, there would have to be places that um, a part is protective zones for them, I think. The only problem is then you're bringing in the population, which stirs up all the wilderness and wildlife, whether it's ATVs, horses, motorbikes, Mm 4x4s. So it it does have a transitional effect on the environment and may not Mm -hmm. be for the positive in regards to that. But people are going to want to see it. They're going to want to try and hunt it. They're going to hope that they can get a, a tag for it, much like a bear tag or a cougar tag or a moose hunt tag. You know, yeah. so it's a Pandora's box. So it's probably easier on the government just to keep it quiet and say it doesn't exist or not admit to it and just keep it hush. Yeah, and I think if there is any conspiracy, it's for all these practical reasons. I I really don't think that our government is creating um, dogmen in the labs and trying to um, make you know, dogs with human characteristics. Some people think there are military uses, um, that maybe you get a super smart dog that can go in and pull off covert operations or battle dogs or that kind of thing. Um, But, you know, I don't think there's any really good evidence for that. It's sorry, I opinion. sorry, I just had to cough there. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. The the beauty okay. of a the beauty of a microphone with a mute button. We only have a few minutes left with you here, Linda. And Joe is asking, are there any laws in place that you know of that you cannot shoot a Bigfoot or a dogman where there's a fine, maybe jail time because it might be a protective species? Yeah, I I'm thinking. I know that there is. And I'm trying to think where it is. It might be Texas. I could be wrong. I'm sorry. I'm I'm not sure right off the top of my head. But I know that it has been declared, Bigfoot at least, has been declared a private, or, or excuse me, um, has been declared protected species. And I'm, I'm thinking it's somewhere in Texas, but I could be wrong. It might be um, the West Coast somewhere. Maybe there's more than one. There may be others I don't know of. So, um, and it, I, I'm sorry, it's, I'm not giving good information, so please don't quote me on this. But I have heard of it. I'll, I'll just say that much. Mm-hmm. Have you ever heard of dogmen interacting with other animals? For instance, we have three listeners who have all had the exact same thing happen in three mm. different parts of North America where they all live in Bigfoot territory and they have all went into their barns to notice that their horses' manes have been braided. Have we ever heard anything along those lines when it comes to dogmen interacting with household pets or farm animals? Um, not in a friendly way. You know, most of the time with a dogman, it's like, 
Um, these ladies heard a commotion and turned on their patio light just in time to see a dog man with their cat in its mouth. This uh, this was by Rockford, actually, on the state line again um, in southeast, south, southern Wisconsin. Um, another time, a uh, man saw one kill, uh, killing his uh, German shepherd. Um, usually, it's, if, it, there's a, if there's anything, any reaction going on, or interaction between the dog man and a pet or a farm animal, it's a predatory one. Um, Bigfoot seems to be, I've I've heard that they um, like dogs or like them as pets, um, that sort of thing. I have one incident that I tell about in in one of my books where um, a, a man and his girlfriend were driving early in the morning and past this driveway, and they both saw the same thing. There was a big foot, and this was in central Wisconsin, there was a big foot standing with its arms sort of out toward them and a dead dog, a smallish dead dog, lying stretched across its arms, and they both felt that it was sad and beseeching them, kind of like, you know, this dog is sick or my, maybe I just played with the dog too hard, can you fix it? You know, that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and on that note, Linda, we're going to wrap things up here. Okay. Thank you so much for being on Spaced Out Radio tonight. You're welcome. Thanks so much for having me. It was great. And we will be back with E Squared, Eric and Eric, joining me for hour number three as we continue talking cryptids right after this. The SOR Sightlines is a place for you to find answers to your strange experiences. Hi there, this is Mike Schmidt. If you have had an encounter with ghosts, UFOs, Bigfoot, ETs, or anything else that doesn't make sense, head to spacedoutradio.com and file a Sightlines report. All information you give is 100% confidential, and I will personally help you find the answers you need. SOR Sightlines, your answers are a click away. Greetings and salutations, space travelers, from the Chronicles of the Unknown team. What is Chronicles of the Unknown? I keep hearing about this thing. It's a new paranormal reality TV show based right here in beautiful British Columbia, Canada. Follow our team as we uncover claims of activity on the Caribou Gold Rush Trail. You can also follow us here every third Monday where two members of our team will be available to answer your questions. We'll give you some equipment updates and some of our experiences on the road, right here on Spaced Out Radio. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with U4 Cop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. With their money-back guarantee and the many benefits, how can you afford not to get one? Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com for mind, body, and spirit, and expect a miracle. This is your medium, Joanna, from Spaced Out Weekend, Two Mediums and a Large. I would love it if you would come and join us with host James Tyson every other Sunday on Spaced Out Weekend. Together, we will take your calls and your questions live. Our goal is to provide you with a positive outlook on deep questions that you may have. Questions regarding love, relationships, money, or whatever else is on your mind. Come and check us out at spacedoutradio.com. Have you checked out the SOR Space Wire at spacedoutradio.com yet? Every day we post the latest stories regarding the weird, strange, and completely unbelievable. From cryptid and UFO sightings to the conspiracy world, we tackle it all. Hi there, I'm Eric Markham, Space Out Radio's news director for the SOR Space Wire. And if you have a story, I want to hear it. 
Email me at news at spaceoutradio.com. Patrolling the Pacific Northwest, we are always on the lookout for the strange and unassuming stories that real people are experiencing. Hi, I'm Vincent Zunza from Pacific North Weird. Me and Alexandra Sullivan have teamed to bring to you those odd stories that never seem to make it into the mainstream. Stories so weird that we'll leave you scratching your head wondering, is this real? It's as real as it gets with Pacific North Weird. You can watch our videos right here at spacedoutradio.com. Become more intimate and interactive with Spaced Out Radio. Join our Space Travelers Club with your new membership. For $5 a month, we'll provide you with special access to the website, monthly prize draws from books to psychic readings, along with monthly newsletter, private interviews, and more. Sign up today to be part of Spaced Out Radio's experience. Every month on Spaced Out Radio, we look into the deep and dark reports of cryptids roaming around the world with me, Rob Morphy, from Cryptopia.us. I would love it if you would join me and host Dave Scott as we delve into the most arcane stories and reports regarding creatures of the unknown. My job is to hunt down the details and bring the evidence forward to you. These aren't your regular Bigfoot stories I'm talking about either. You can find out more about crypto history at spacedoutradio.com. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. Spacedoutradio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? Strange creatures lurking in the night, the sounds of wood knocking in the forest, odd happenings right out of a fictional world. These are the reports I love. Hi there, this is author Ronald Murphy, and I would love it if you join me and Spaced Out Radio host Dave Scott the second Wednesday of every month on our journey into the unknown land of cryptozoology at spacedoutradio.com. From Mothman to Frogman and everything in between, hey, they don't call me the crypto guru for nothing. Did you know that Spaced Out Radio runs seven days a week? Hi, it's James Tyson from Spaced Out Weekend. Every Saturday and Sunday night, starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, you can join me and my guests for some great chatter about what's going on out in the universe or even in that dark part of the basement you really don't want to go back into. Well, let's find the answers to your experiences together. So come on up to Uncle Jimbo's cabin on the weekend. For more information, look us up at spacedoutradio.com. Would you like to connect with us on Spaced Out Radio? Head to spacedoutradio.com to check out the latest shows, guests, and sponsors. And don't forget to sign up for the Space Travelers Club. You'll find all you need at spacedoutradio.com. Welcome back for hour number three of Spaced Out Radio tonight. Good to have you along for the ride. We had Linda Godfrey on the first two hours. We go to Eric and Eric E Squared from S4 with E Squared here on spacedoutradio.com. If you're an SOR space traveler, your password for tonight set by Bill Cardwell is gargantuan. Gargantuan is your password. Make sure you use it wisely because you don't want to trip and fall and forget the password or anything like that. If you're listening along the Revolution Radio chat room or just listening online, remember the Double R Machine is a donation station financed by you, the valued listener. Do us a favor. Donate today and help out the cause. If you want to follow us on Twitter, you can do so at Spaced Out Radio. Give our Facebook page a like, Spaced Out Radio Show. On Instagram, I can be followed at Dave Scott SOR. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio Show. And our website is spacedoutradio.com. While there, you can join the SOR Space Travelers Club. You can find us on TuneIn. Download our podcasts on iTunes. 